On game night, there's only one food delivery service that's a real slam dunk. Grubhub's got you covered with game time eats, late night treats, lazy lunches, family dinners, and more. It's all on Grubhub. And now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. So you pay zero delivery fees when you order. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for details. And with the holidays right around the corner, Grubhub gift cards are the perfect gift for everyone on your list. Download the Grubhub app today. Go for Grubhub. This holiday, Audible invites you to listen in on some of today's most creative musicians telling their stories in their own words. Origins is an Audible Originals podcast series featuring music and memories from artists like Billie Eilish, Camilo, Doja Cat, Flying Lotus, and more. Discover what shaped their creativity and get drawn into the immersive sound design that lets you feel the experiences that inspired them. Start listening to this innovative new series at audible.com slash origins. Wonderful Pistachios, your healthy snack nut. Learn more at wonderfulpistachios.com. Hi there, I'm Zach Braff. And I'm Donald Faison. We're real-life best friends, but we met playing fake life best friends, Turk and JD, on the sitcom Scrubs. 20 years later, we've decided to re-watch the series one episode at a time and put our memories into a podcast you can listen to at home. We're going to get all our special guest friends like Sarah Chalk, John C. McGinley, Neil Flynn, Judy Reyes. Show creator Bill Lawrence, editors, writers, and even prop masters will tell us about what inspired the series and how we became a family. You can listen to the podcast Fake Doctors, Real Friends with Zach and Donald on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. Today's show is brought to you by Drip Drop, which is an electrolyte powder developed by a doctor to treat dehydration. This stuff is absolutely incredible. So just mix it with water. It works fast. It tastes amazing. Do it before a run, a workout. I've been doing it after a sauna recently. It is so, so good. I highly encourage you to check it out at dripdrop.com and use the code WORDS, W-O-R-D-S, to get 20% off any purchase. I can't endorse this stuff highly enough. It's the best. Go to dripdrop.com and use the code WORDS to get 20% off any purchase. Try it now. Support for today's show comes from the Life is Good Ping podcast. Join the co-founders of Life is Good, Bert and John Jacobs, as they talk to influential musicians, athletes, business leaders, and everyday people about the role of optimism in their lives. Who doesn't need more optimism? They'll also end each episode with a ping pong charity challenge where the winner gets to donate to their charity of choice. Go to the Life is Good Ping podcast that is launched on any podcast catcher you use. And their first guest was Ringo Starr. Unbelievable. So subscribe now on Stitcher, Spotify, or iTunes, and add some good vibes to your day. Now, here's the show. Hello, everybody. How are you doing today? I am Ray Harkins, hanging out with you on this beautiful Wednesday in August. Today's a very special day because this is the seventh anniversary of this podcast. We're 364 episodes in. It blows my mind that I've been able to do it as long as I have, and it's uh, it's thanks to you, the listener, because you know you uh, you keep downloading this thing, and it keeps getting more and more popular. And uh, I just I don't know. I feel very thankful, but I also am thankful to our guest because our guest this week is John Dyer Baisley from the band Baroness. I love Baroness so much. I have watched their trajectory for quite some time. Musically, they're incredible artistic wise like he's i mean an unbelievable visual artist has done all of their record covers and he's done so many amazing record covers for so many bands i've always wanted him on the show uh but frankly just didn't really you know have any kind of connections into him via um you know friends like we have mutual friends but not to the extent where i would bug them to have john come on the show but uh my publicist friend monica was working their new record and i was like can we please make this happen she said yes and i love it so that's what we did but um, let's, let's slow down for a moment. This show has changed my life in so many different ways. And um, the fact that I've been able to make friendships and I've been able to, um, yeah, I mean, frankly, make money off this thing too, and also to be able to be a lifeline to many people who, frankly, don't feel either, you know, as up to date with like the newest bands or are able to go to as many shows as they used to. This uh, this podcast has served as a touch point for them, and I know many others because uh, yeah, I get emails. You know, you can email the show one hundred words podcast at gmail dot com. But 
I'm just really thankful that I can create real relationships with people, you know, as they consume this podcast and consume these people's stories, because it's incredibly important to me to document this whole music scene and make sure that people understand the importance of it, not only to me and the guest, but to the, you know, punk, hardcore, independent music world, uh, you know, from a wider perspective. And I just, uh, I'm, I feel so, so thankful to be do th- able to do this week over week and have you pay attention to it. So thank you, the listener. And you'll also notice we have a new theme song done by my friend. His name is Eugene Kim, but uh, he pens songs underneath the name Doom and Plume. And so, uh, yeah, we, him and I corresponded with each other for, I don't know, a couple weeks kind of honing and, uh, you know, telling him my vision of what I would like the song to sound like, because, you know, I like to change it up after a while because we've had uh, lowercase noises for those of you that have followed the show for a while. That was the theme song for the past uh, about three years or so. And, um, I wanted to change it up. So that's what we got doom and plume. So you can listen to that for the next, I don't know, year, two years, maybe even longer. So also please rate, review and subscribe to this show. So that way you are kept up to date with all of the recent happenings and comings and goings of the show. Uh, and frankly, just tell your friends because that's uh, the most powerful thing that we can all do to spread this stuff. Um, before we get into the show and my chat with uh, John Dyer Baisley, my son is here. He's just watching me record this. You can say hi, Raymond. Hi. Yep. He's in the background. But, uh, this is also a, um, you know, it's special for me to be able to share this, this stuff with my son because, He likes music. He likes a very different style of music than what we feature here, but uh, just his passion for it, it makes me really happy. And I think that's what all of us need to foster with not only, you know, if we have kids or with our friends and family, just make sure that they're passionate about music in some capacity because this thing is so life-giving. So anyways, let's talk to John, okay? Now here's it. So I'm going to take you back mm-hmm. to uh, probably about uh, 2005. I saw you at uh, the fest at the Atlantic, if I'm not mistaken, um, and witnessing kind of the, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a punk and hardcore kid, so that's my roots. And anytime, you know, I see a band that starts to kind of bring all of those different disparate audiences together, I'm like, this is really cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's always exciting. Um, and then especially when you can obviously introduce, you know, the, uh, the, the metal kids into the element as well. Um, I really noticed it at that, right. at that particular show. Um, I presume that that was kind of, um, not the plan per se, but like, did you find that sort of initial groundswell of support coming from those particular scenes more than anything else? Yes, probably simply by virtue of the fact that that was, you know, that was the, that was the scene we were, you know, we were, we were in, we were involved in, a, you know, as, as, you know, just as kids, like we were, we were, we were friends and we came up in, you know, the, the punk hardcore community, uh, albeit, you know, when we were younger, it was, it was in a very rural, rural area. Uh, and then when, uh, you know, around, um, let's see, 2000, you know, between 2000, and 2011, I lived in Savannah, Georgia. And, you know, that, that was, that town had a very, you know, had a very unique, very active uh, punk and hardcore community uh, because geographically we were located off of all the major tour routings. So when, you know, around, around between 2000, 2005, really like we were, you know, we and the few other, the, you know, very small number of other bands that were uh, around in Savannah, Georgia. We were, we, if we wanted to see shows, if we wanted to play shows in Savannah, we basically had to book them. And so our interest, you know, our, our interest in, in, you know, like crust, punk, hardcore, uh, metal, and, all, you know, all things, all the sort of stuff that was below marquee level, like we were bringing that sort of stuff into town. And, and I'm talking about only one, cl- there were two, there were basically two venues. There was a, um, a venue called 2424, which was a DIY space that our roadie, uh, now, uh, now artist, my artist friend, Jeremy Hush ran. And then there was a, a club, more proper club, but it was just sort of lo- the local punk place, punk club, you know, where we hung out called the jinx. Mm-hmm. And that's where, you know, that's really where everything happens, where we wrote 
uh, this is where we wrote, you know, the majority of our early material. Uh, it's where we worked. It's where we saw shows. It's where we hung out, and it's where you know, it's where I came to understand how the community worked, uh, you know, in a pragmatic sense. Uh, so that when the band was ready to tour, we were. Uh, we were at least in, you know, in for, in, we, we had a, we had a, you know, a, a national network of friends. Uh, we had an understanding on the fine points of running a, sh you know, operating a show without, uh, you know, without, without professionals around, you know, we, we knew how to set up PAs. We knew how to, you know, work our equipment and we knew how to flyer. We know how to book shows. We know how to print merch. We know how to, uh, you know, get ourselves where we needed to go. I mean, it was, it really was like just, more because because you know I, I realized that Baroness wasn't really a punk band. We weren't really we weren't really a metal band. We weren't really anything right. uh, stylistically, but we were friends with those. We were friend friendly in those scenes, and that was you know that, that was sort of our bread and butter. So um, you know so when it when when we started touring it, you know everything was DIY. It was like subsistence living. You know whatever you whatever you were up to on Monday. You need to, you know, you need to make just enough money to get through Tuesday, and on Tuesday you make just enough to get through Wednesday. Because we were doing like, you know, 250 shows. Two, I think, I think we maxed out in 2004. I think we did 275 shows. Right. And by shows, I mean basements, VFW halls, uh, you know, like dive bars that would have us. Uh, sh you know, we so everywhere from you know like skate parks to shooting galleries. I mean, we just saw the wor the best and the worst of America, uh, you know, on repeat continually for, for years and years and years. And so that community was really important to me. It, you know, it, and as we grew and as we grew out of the, per you know, those perceived genre or style boundary lines, it was, you know, which, which I never recognized or identified with to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, we had developed an operating, you know, uh, like an operating mechanism or, or, or a way of, you know, a modus operandi that, that, that I still recognize as being like both present in the way we do things now, but critical for the way, you know, for, for the growth and development of this band. And it's something that I recognize in, in, in people who have shared experience and they have that shared experience. It's just one of those things. When you meet somebody who's come up that way, you know it immediately. And when you meet more, more obviously when you meet somebody who hasn't come up that way, it's, it's, it's very apparent. Uh, and that, you know, it, that comes down to, you know, this, this like mentality that, that sometimes exists when bands start and they think, oh, I need a booking agent. I need a manager. I need this, that, and the other thing to get my band. And, you know, kids ask me for advice and, you know, what, what do I do to start a band? Want, you know, or, or I've got a band. What do we do to get out there and make it? I'm usually just like, uh, well, don't hire anybody until you need them, but more importantly, write, you know, just write good songs and figure out, figure out every aspect and every angle of the shows that you're putting on. If you can, if you know how to do that, you'll have respect for the people ultimately that will do it for you. Uh, you will, you will understand the amount, the sheer amount of work, the volume of work that goes into, uh, putting on a show, making a record, booking a tour. And, you know, you, you are, I, I think by virtue of that fact, you are able to move more smoothly in this, you know, community of music that, you know, from, from the DIY level up to the, uh, you know, up the mainstream, there are systems in place that, make it very difficult for we as musicians to you know just to get by uh but if you if you understand the system uh from the inside out on a fundamental level then you're better equipped to uh know when you know when and where you're being taken advantage of and how to you know how to get yourself out of sticky situations uh you know it's it's kind of like let me boil it down to this mm -hmm. every lesson that i've ever learned i've learned the hard way and because i learned it the hard way the lesson stuck. Right. <laughs> totally, totally. And to your point, uh, you know, pulling one thread there uh, that you were talking about was the, um, 
I've always compared Athens to, uh, you know, Memphis in many different ways, obviously bands like, you know, his hero's gone, you know, man with gun, all that whole scene that did the same exact thing of what you were talking about, where it's like, no one played Memphis from a, you know, DIY level. So do you had to bring bands in in order to kind of build, like you said, that connective tissue, the idea of just like, cause I mean, it's yeah. not like, it's not like they're, you guys were <laughs> sitting back and being like, Oh, we're really learning business principles here. You're just like, well, no, we got to put out a demo. So no, 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 yeah, no. <laughs> exactly. In fact, we, I think we were avoiding business principles because we have so, you know, this is, this is just a problem of youth. I think you, we were avoiding or eschewing the, the idea of business and music because based on our experience in punk, it, 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 seemed, it seemed a thing that was demonized and the thing that was uh, a negative, you know, like always a negative, can't be a positive. But you, you know, let's, let's be real. Like that's a, that's a young, that's a younger attitude on things. And it doesn't always, it it doesn't, it's just realistically, that's that's not what's happening. Like you just bought dinner. That was a financial transaction. You just had to fill your tank with gas. Another financial transaction. You just stayed on somebody's floor. Well, you just traded commodity, right? (laughs) You know, in yeah, in in, in a way. And so, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you, it's all, this for that. And it's happening constantly. And, you know, more importantly, as you learn that, you know, you learn how to do it where you're in such a way that you're not stepping on somebody else or you're not, you know, uh, making advantageous moves for yourself that negatively affect those around you. In the best case scenario, you know, the, the DIY community taught me how as a community, we can all help each other out and we can all grow simultaneously and in tandem. And when that happens, that, you know, that warms my heart. That, that brings a great, you know, makes it, puts a smile on my face. And yes, when, when, you know, when you've got a, when you've got a scene that's, that's got nothing, well, you got nothing to lose. So you just build and you build and you build. And in, in the case of Savannah, we, uh, we built something kind of strange and something that people outside of our locale were recognizing as, having the, this, you know, particular sound or, partic- you know, just like a particular attitude. Let me solve all of your holiday shopping problems right now by talking to you about the premium audio products from Raycon. They have wireless earbuds, headphones, and speakers that offer premium sound. I personally adore the wireless earbuds. I've been using them for four or five years. They got a ton of battery life. We're talking 54 plus hours. It's incredible. And honestly, I have gotten them for gifts for my significant other. I've gotten them for my family and friends. And they all come back to me and they're like, dude, this is incredible. Why have I never used these before? And I'm like, I don't know. That's your fault. That's why I am here to help you. And for the next month, Raycon will have a countdown to Christmas with a new pop-up flash deal for you to take advantage of every single day. Now, what can you do? You can go to buyraycon.com slash Ray and get the best deals around. That gets you 15% off site-wide with code HOLIDAY plus free shipping. That is code HOLIDAY at buyraycon.com slash Ray for 15% off your Raycon purchase and then free shipping. So again, go to buyraycon.com slash Ray, solve all of your shopping problems, and then maybe, you know, toss a pair of headphones there for you, okay? Maybe just an idea, but... Thank you, Raycon, and buy them now. We know that women deserve to be heard and protected. But what is it about trans women that makes so many people, in particular men, turn a blind eye to hate and violence against them? Hi, I'm Zach Safford, host of In the Deep, Stories That Shape Us. In this episode, you'll hear from T.S. Madison, who began her career as a sex worker, and she's not afraid to speak about it. Through her bold personality and her work as a producer and artist, she's become a pillar in the LGBTQ plus community, representing self-love and acceptance. Listen as Maddie explains the many hurdles she had to overcome and how she persevered, becoming the best version of herself. Listen to In the Deep, Stories That Shape Us, an iHeartRadio original podcast coming to you on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The next chapter in your story includes knowing your status. Learn more and press play on your future at HIVTestNow.com, sponsored by Gilead. What's the worst thing about sports? That's right. All those breaks in play. 
but you can make them all better by using Grubhub. You wouldn't have a movie night without snacks, so why would you settle for a halftime without food? Grubhub has every food you could possibly crave, from national favorites to local spots. Reorder your regulars or find something brand lip-smackingly new. You can search by city, cuisine, restaurant name, or if it's a firm favorite, even by menu item. Delivered on time at the lowest price. Order through the Grubhub app or online at Grubhub.com. That's Grubhub.com. And of course, don't forget, with the holidays right around the corner, Grubhub gift cards are the perfect gift for everyone on your list. Now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. That's zero dollar food delivery fees from your favorite restaurants. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for terms and details. Go for Grubhub. We never really identified with that. And that was just being talked about around us so frequently that you couldn't ignore it. But there was, you know, we, it's not like we had, there was like the Savannah, you know, sludge, psychedelic sludge, metal, <laughs> pop, right. you know, doom music consortium. We didn't, there wasn't, we didn't, we didn't have meetings and discuss, you know, how things were going to work. We just didn't have any, we, we didn't have like elders to, to copy. Right. So we just invented the rule book and the rule book, when it worked, that, that became how things were going to be. And when it didn't, then, you know, hey, lesson learned, move on, do, do it differently next time. Today's show is brought to you by, frankly, one of my favorite sponsors of all time, Sonos. It is the unbelievable speaker company that designs every speaker from the inside out. So what is it? You've probably heard me speak about it before, but if you haven't, it is unbelievable what they do. So you can order whatever it is on Sonos.com that you're interested in. You can plug it in and in less than five minutes, you are ready to play whatever music you are looking to play over the speakers in your house. You can have one in the bedroom, you can have one in the living room, and they can all play different music all from the Sonos app. It's awesome. So last night, as an example, my son was having a difficult time falling asleep put in some bony bear for him to listen to and fall asleep. And then I could listen to some different music in the bedroom. It is the best and it is so easy to set up. So I highly, highly encourage you to go to Sonos.com and check out all of their product features because it's, like I said, it's the best speaker that I have ever heard. And they also have this awesome, awesome thing called, it's like true tune, true play. That's what it's called. And you can set up every single room where you walk around with your phone, use the microphone, make sure that that speaker is calibrated perfectly to the room that you are setting it up in. This stuff is unbelievable. Sonos is a superior listening mechanism for all of your music. So go to Sonos.com to learn more. I love you, Sonos. And, and kind of on that same line was the, um, you know, wh- wh- where was the kind of intro to that whole, you know, DIY independent scene? You know, I- I'm presuming that, you know, as you were kind of coming up in high school, that's kind of when things started to get introduced to you and, and injected into your, um, you know, ecosystem. Uh, was that the case or was that, you know, were you uh, going to record stores? Was it, you know, the skate culture? How did that introduce itself to you? Well, the the thing you have to understand is that where where I you know where I grew up and where you know Baron us Mark one two three four and five, uh, we we were we all grew up in uh, uh, in and, and around a small a very very small town in uh, Virginia called Lexington, mm-hmm. which uh, I think you know populations anywhere between twenty five hundred and five thousand depending on whether or not the, the universities were in session but you know we were we, li- we were lo- we were local kids we lived in the county and um there are there was there was a record store but it was like you know it's where you went to buy used grateful dead cds that or dave matthews it wasn't really like a record store that appealed to me so we didn't have a record store uh nirvana broke at the right time for me uh, and that was my access point. Like MTV taught me more than just about anything. So through Nirvana, I found the Melvins. I found Dinosaur Jr. I found Sonic Youth. I found K Records. I found, uh, you know, then, uh, you know, then it just, it just, it spread out to, uh, you know, the roots of punk. And, you know, then I'm listening to like, you know, 77 style punk, 82 style punk, you know, the English stuff, the, then you go like the Eastern European stuff. Then all of a sudden, you know, you're trading tapes, you're, you're buying, uh, you know, seven inches and everything like that. Everything's mail order. You know, we're, we're just like, you know, we're just a bunch of kids in the country. We don't understand 
we don't understand any of the scenes at all because we don't live in them. Right. So the cultural context is completely lost on us. So we develop, you know, even in Virginia, we developed this unique thing. Uh, then when I was in Savannah, you know, there was already, a, you know, sort of a thing that was happening down there. We just kind of inserted ourselves into it. And it, you know, it just kind of grew in a really weird way. Like my thought was always, you know, like uh, uh, the the appeal of this whole thing is, you know, ostensibly that you are you get to be your own person. And I always identified my, myself as an artist or, or as a creative person, not as a musician, not certainly not as a punk or a metal guy or mm-hmm. or anything like that. You know, in fact, I, even even to this day, I, you know, I still find that there's very many times where I'm not accepted with fully open arms into into these into these little like clubs and that that's fine that's what i'm used to you know i grew up you know i grew up in a, in a rural place where you know most of everybody that i knew was you know was like more on the countryside of things and you had a lot of rednecks and a lot of a lot of intolerant attitudes and a lot of uh you know cliques and stuff like that in, in that way and so for me being an outsider was always kind of the important part of it, it was like yeah of course so two of continually been an outsider always felt like a natural thing to me even insofar as you know where we sit today and you know i i I think people myself included have a very hard time exactly defining what baroness is like where do we fit in the grand scheme of things like you'd be at this point you'd never ever call us a punk band uh loosely you know loosely associated with metal but i don't think I, i think calling us a metal band sort of does disservice to metal bands uh but neither are we an indie rock band or a pop band or a radio rock band. There's like none of these things, you know? Yeah. Um, so like being on the outside, I think is, has always been a big part, has played a big role in, in my, uh, development as, as an, as an artist and as a musician. Uh, it's certainly where I've learned to feel most comfortable, um, you know, for better, for better, for worse. But I think, you know, I think it's also forced my hand to, you know, to develop something that, uh, you know, if I'm going to make a community, it's going to be a really small one. It's going to be me and my, the musicians I play with, the crew that we have, and you know, the people that we work, the art, the artists that we work with, and that's that's the you know that's the crew, that's the scene. So it's just it's just part of the project, you know, rather than uh, rather than you know like like identifying as part of the hardcore scene, where then you have to play by hardcore scene rules, or you know, identifying as pop country, and then yeah, you got to do you got to be a pop country guy, like. Better, for me, it's better to just beg, borrow, and steal what you want because at the end of the day, it's, it's self-expression. Yep. So it's supposed to be unique. It's supposed to be different. And sometimes it's supposed to be something that people don't quite understand. Yeah. Uh, and that's the, my, my most valuable experiences in music have been with bands that push push those boundaries and offer alternative uh, offer more interesting alternatives to you know the current status quo um you know and i saw that i saw that in a lot of events that were influential on me when i was younger bands like fugazi who you know set a very different standard you know it was yeah you, you know talking about it's one thing but doing it's a different you know is different so i'm i'm kind of like at this point i fall more on the on the side of you know actions do in fact speak louder than words and if you're gonna you know if you've got a point to prove get out there and prove it you know sure. don't waste don't waste time talking just like prove it and that seems to have a better impact on uh you know the audience that needs it anyway because then there's this other thing that happened i'm sorry i'm just kind of running no i love that it question Keep going. But, um, yeah. <laughs> uh i you know i felt as as we, there were certain points when you know certain developmental stages at the point you know with, with baroness where i felt that each night we would go on a stage and I could look out in the audience and I pretty much knew them. You know, I pretty much know everybody that's there. Sure. If I don't know them specifically by name. I know where they come from, you know, to a certain degree. Not, I'm not claiming that I'm like a crowd whisperer or anything like that. Right, right, it's right. just to say that, like, you know, if you're playing, if, if you're a black metal band and you're playing a show and everybody's in corpse paint and got studs, you know, poking out of their wrists and, you know, all, all, all the whole nine yards, like you're not telling anybody anything about Satan that they haven't already heard. So if you're, if you've got a message that you're trying to put out there, if you've got something that you think is interesting enough that it's worth hearing, why wouldn't you try to reach the people who, who want, you know, who haven't heard that yet 
and try to make an impact on them. And I'm not talking about being a black metal band or in a Satan or anything like that. But, uh, you know, for me, it's like the DIY community was so important. And the idea of self-sufficiency, self-proficiency, uh, you know, quality over quantity, bucking the system, uh, questioning the status quo, always asking yourself why. And, you know, most importantly for a band like this, where I don't think we have, a you know, a, an outward political agenda or social agenda, uh, but more, more a creative and personal one. Like if, if, you know, music is about the human experience, if if it's about self-expression, if it's about communicating in a nonverbal way from our, you know, from our speakers and our stage to their own, our audience's ears, and then to receive the input that they, you know, whether it's energy or, or applause or dancing or, or, singing, singing and coming, like that's what's important to me. And to reach people who haven't quite gotten that phone call yet, that seems the more interesting thing. So then it's like, should we be so ambitious and so presumptuous that we think we can make a difference from the inside out? And I think in more recent years, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, I think, I think it's more fun and more engaging for us when we're putting ourselves in, in situations where we don't understand that well and see, you know, because more work for us, we have to prove, our value in a more substantive way. Uh, and we've got, you know, and we have to put ourselves up against the world's greatest bullshit detector, which is the crowd, you know, the, the idea of a crowd, the idea of a crowd has never heard you. They are going to immediately give you every visible emotional energy clue that you can possibly receive about whether or not you're doing a good job or not. And, you know, that kind of stuff, as I said, more recently has been, you know, of interest to me because I don't want to end up, you know, a musician playing to the same crowd time and time again, where they're just, you know, judging this performance against the last, but I want to create compelling, unique experiences where, you know, occasionally somebody who's never thought they were going to be interested in, you know, the sort of music that we play or the sort of shows that we're involved with is all of a sudden, uh, uh, you know, is all of a sudden enraptured by it and, and, you know, we've caught their attention and then, and then we're doing something, you know, then we're doing something new, something we don't have control over. In fact, it's more, it's more about their involvement, uh, than rather than our like proficiency or precision, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, to your point, it's one of those things where it's more valuable, uh, like you were saying to be on, you know, on the quote unquote inside existing within the sort of, you know, structure of the music business as it were, but to your, to what you were saying, you are now a, a gateway band where people that have no context for everything from a foundational perspective that is important to you, like the whole DIY culture and not even removing genres, just DIY in general. And like you can send yeah. people down a rabbit hole in ways that, you know, like you can just by the mention of Fugazi in this interview, you could get a person who has no clue who that band is. And then all of a sudden open their eyes up and open their world up in ways that you wouldn't have been able to do if you just existed within the confines of, you know, these really, really small and secular scenes or whatever. Yeah, precisely. And, you know, because it's, it is that it's, 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 you mean, you know, it's, it's the idea of confines. It's the idea of secularism and, and, uh, you know, invisible boundaries that I, I would like to think that we can provide an alternative to, uh, you know, I, I have found that there are, there is a, there is really, you know, some interest out there in, in, in certain types of bands and being exclusive. I don't, I don't quite understand it other than maybe, you know, it, it allows a scene to feel important and, like, like us against the world sort of thing. But, but you're like, why would you create that system yourself? Why would you, why would you create an exclusive system just for, you know, just on the basis of, you know, a fight or something like that? Like it, yeah, it's, it's complete nonsense to me. Uh, and, and it's, and it's, it's low hanging fruit. You know, it's, it's, it's easy to do that. More difficult is becoming an inclusive band in a way that doesn't sacrifice your creative integrity or your, uh, you know, artistic mores. And that's, 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 you know, that's what we really always been on about. Sure. The core, the, yeah, know, the, core, the kinda, core values are intact. I kind of don't care if we're successful or not. I, you know, I just want to try it's, it's, you know, <laughs> but I'm a process guy. So the process is, 
you know, a- almost always trumps the, you know, the, the effect or the output or the, you know, how, are, how are things shake out. Like, why not have high, why not have a high set of standards? Why not be ambitious? Why not set impossible goals? At least when you fail, you can go, eh, it was never realistic to begin with. Right. And, you know, when you succeed, you can go, well, that's an honest, honest success. I, I didn't did expect that. that. Yeah. You know, that was work. We, yeah, I didn't expect that. And we did that through sheer willpower or something. Yeah. No, no, it's it's a very good point. I mean, I think that's why you can, uh, you know, the, the the fan base that exists for bands like you know you guys, Neurosis, and the you know there's of course like flirtations with a uh, not even just flirtations, but just success on a larger stage in different increments of the of you know bands like you guys and, and their career and, and many others, but when you are still fundamentally the um, you know same principled uh band and not even like principled like you know you're getting on a soapbox and being like everybody needs to be this way because that's clearly what you're not trying to do but you have you have fans that can follow you at every iteration of your sound and still understand that at the core it's like well yeah it's it's still baroness like yeah it doesn't sound anything like their their previous records but like i I understand where they're coming from (laughs) yeah yeah, and you know, and and any any time I've ever caught in any caught any sort of flack for you know that that sort of like seismic shift that we that we really work for you know in between each record, uh, you know when there's when there's kickback from that, first off I accept it. You know that's part of that's the risk reward uh, calculation that you make. Well, we're gonna you know probably gonna have to break a few eggs to make this omelet, so to speak. Um, and that's, you know, that's going to, it may, you know, you do everything at the risk of maybe, uh, affecting the, you know, offending the sensibility of those people who've supported us, but also for any of our fans who are like, you know, not feeling the direction, it's like, well, you did see that coming, right? Like right. This, we telegraphed this, this, this a little this, bit. This, yeah. This, yeah. There's a, this is the common thread. That is the common thread. It's not, you know, our batting average is never going to be a thousand. Right. Uh, we're trying, you know, we, we try, but, but our, you know, creatively our, our goal in writing is to create music that we want to hear that, you know, like, and I've said this before, I'm just writing music that I wish somebody else had written before me. Cause it, it ain't easy to play. It's right. very difficult to come about. Uh, and you know, oftentimes because, because of the, the, concept and the you know the the content of uh of our music it, it's man it's really dark it's it's not it's not like i'm writing these songs because i love to focus on you know my deficiencies and the things that i struggle with and my anxieties and my depressions and my aches and pains i don't love that i do it because i, I don't have a better way of dealing with them and and you know creativity has offered me this fantastically pure uh an elegant way to turn minuses into pluses mm-hmm. like totally I, I i that's what that's what's always that's what's always appealed to me about music however i, sh- I should note that that's that's my attitude i play in a band with people and i can't force that idea on them because that's that's not the way that they feel so well, I think I think what's becoming interesting about this band is, is that we balance some very seemingly contradictory things with one another. Like, you know, for instance, Sebastian, our drummer, his his attitude is it's so psyched and so up that it's it's just a it's a good uh, you know it's a good counterpoint to his up is a good counterpoint to my down, and that's what makes you know that's what makes our music celebratory in the face of adversity and that's what allows me to more uh efficiently take you know take the the, take these dark things and shed some light on them in a way that uh that is both cathartic for me as the artist but but also i I found becomes an easy it's, it's almost like a conversation starter for a for for a conversation that's never spoken uh, so our, you know, our audience picks up on that that sort of stuff, and they respond to that. And they, you know, I think if we if we've written a, a, a good song, people find themselves in in the story or in the you know in the poetry. They they see they see or feel or respond to something emotional uh, that's that I'm putting out there. 
Um, and I try not to be overly specific about it because, because I don't want to, I don't want to taint their experience, uh, that, you know, that, that can be helpful in a way. I've, I've, you know, I've found music to be incredibly rehabilitative to me, not just my own, but, you know, more specifically uh, other artists who's, you know, who I, whose work reminds me of my experience and allows me to think about it in a more meaningful and, and, and deep seated way. And it's, you know, I feel it's, it's humbling to have heard, uh, some feedback from from our fans that that leads me to think that they're having a similar experience with our music, and it's it's re, it's it's reassuring in a way. I don't, you know, I'm not placing all my money on that. You know, that that'd be that'd be kind of presumptuous. But again, at the end of the day, I'm just writing. Like I, I think this band's duty is to write music that that pushes forward, that has elements of. Uh, or or aspects that that are they're brand new, idiosyncratic. You know, it's got to be us. And the more fluid we become as musicians, the more uh, the more obligatory or the greater the obligation for us to uh, you know to dig in deeper and tell a more genuine story in greater earnest with more passion and vigor. And uh, you know, that's that's really fun it is really fun to do it's really tough to do but it's also kind of tricky sometimes because i'm putting a lot of myself out there and i don't want to be drained at the end of the day and Mm -hmm. at the end of the album i don't want to think that i've given so much psychic energy away or so much emotional energy away that 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 i'm that i'm spent you know um which is why i I appreciate the the aspects of our music that, that you know push it up because you know, I, I mean, I'm not even. I'm serious. Like every night I play these songs, I'm just. It's. I'm just like. Yeah, you're done. Crying through them, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm. 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 I'm putting everything I have into them because I mean them. They. It, they're, they're. They're. Vastly important songs to me. It doesn't. That doesn't mean they need to be important to anybody else. You know, they can be fun to some people. They can be. It can be just like yeah, good, good like rock and roll time or like awesome experiments and sound but to me you know there's there's substance behind these things and working that out every night is it's not easy but it does it does help me you know it does it does offer that that therapy that i need so it's creative it's therapeutic it's communicative it allows me as somebody with social anxieties to you know to deal with lots of people all at the same time and and to you know c- create communal experiences i get to travel like to you know all sorts of stuff and it rules to be in a band right. but it's not easy <laughs> No. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it, it definitely is uh, the, the concept of work. Uh, Cause obviously a lot of people exist in the sort of, you know, Peter Pan lifestyle of, you know, touring and like, you know, touring is a suspended state of animation. Like anybody that's done it for a prolonged period of time knows that they're not participating in real life. They're participating in this, you know, sort of uh, alternate route that, you know, you can tap into it occasionally. Um, and that's where you kind of, to your point, that's where you get the kind of creative energy in order to be able to write about other experiences rather than like, cause you know, clearly Baroness has never written a record about tour per se, you know, it's not like the, Oh, the, it's right, rough being right. on the road, you know? And so I think to your point, it's, it is one of those things where you, you don't want to be this uh, self-serving uh, band that is uh, speaking about really singular experiences that, um, you know, people can sort of understand, but uh, yeah, you're, you're trying to root this yeah. in a much more emotional place. Yeah. I mean, like reconcil- reconciling with the fact that we don't, you know, our agenda is what is an emotional one, you know, and our, you know, our output comes off as impassioned and, and, and emotional. You know, right. this is not something, this is what I've learned, um, from the other members of my band. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, cause I, I don't know, maybe I'm just, you know, I was too blind to see that, that sort of stuff. Um, so I'm just sort of rehashing what, the, what they told me, but I, I see the value in it now. And I've had to, I've, as I said, I've had to reconcile with it. I've had to become comfortable with it. Yep. I've had to, you know, like I got to a point where it was important for me to understand what we were. And I couldn't tell you, I couldn't have told you what we were. And when, you know, after this, you know, horrifying thing in 2012 where the bus went off the cliff and I got all broken up all badly like that. Um, you know, we, we were forced to get a new rhythm section. So, so Sebastian Thompson and Nick Joe started the band. And as they were joining, you know, and these guys weren't, the, the, the interesting thing about them is they weren't prior fans. Seb knew who we were. I, I, I think Nick, Nick had maybe heard of us, but 
there were this was it was like the community of musician friends that that allowed me access to to these guys and they joined and were such important additions and important such important people in my life now but it was through them through essentially non-fans who are joining a group and then inserting themselves and then and then adopting the group as it as their family it took it took their evaluation of what was you know what made our band special to really allow you know to really give me that insight in a in a realistic way where uh, you know I didn't I didn't need it wasn't like I, I didn't need a pat on the back I wasn't asking what what was great you know I, was, I wasn't like oh tell me what's great about parents I didn't know I just didn't know I didn't know I I've always considered myself sort of just you know kind of lucky or tenacious like maybe tenacious and equal parts lucky and tenacious but also extremely unlucky in some ways I think it's, I think I've got maybe the best worst luck that I know of. <laughs> sure, and, sure. and so, you know, I was at, so like, well, you know, when we were reforming the band, I was, I was really like in a confused, frustrated, uh, sort of isolated and lonely place. And I didn't know really how to proceed. And, you know, they, they were very blunt and honest and, you know, in what they heard in our band that, that was appealing to them, and, you know, as they, after they- We know that women deserve to be heard and protected. But what is it about trans women that makes so many people, in particular men, turn a blind eye to hate and violence against them? Hi, I'm Zach Safford, host of In the Deep, Stories That Shape Us. In this episode, you'll hear from T.S. Madison, who began her career as a sex worker, and she's not afraid to speak about it. Through her bold personality and her work as a producer and artist, she's become a pillar in the LGBTQ plus community, representing self-love and acceptance. Listen as Maddie explains the many hurdles she had to overcome and how she persevered becoming the best version of herself. Listen to In the Deep, Stories That Shape Us, an iHeartRadio original podcast coming to you on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The next chapter in your story includes knowing your status. Learn more and press play on your future at HIVTestNow.com, sponsored by Gilead. On game night, there's only one food delivery service that's a slam dunk. A home run. A hole in one. A touchdown. Uh, Sorry, I got a bit carried away there. It's Grubhub. For game night eats, late night treats, and sweet and salty faves you crave, lazy lunches, delicious family dinners, and more, it's all about the Grubhub. We all have days when cooking just isn't in the cards. Grubhub is there when you need it most, offering up everything you want from national favorites to the best kept secret spots in town, ensuring that there's truly something for everyone. Right now, now Amazon Prime members get a year of Grubhub Plus for free. So you pay $0 in food delivery fees when you order from your favorite restaurants. Visit goforgrubhub.com slash Amazon for details. And of course, with the holidays right around the corner, Grubhub gift cards are the perfect gift for everyone on your list. Who doesn't love the gift of food? Order online at grubhub.com or download the Grubhub app from your app store. Place your order and streamline your order and future food deliveries. That's grubhub.com or the Grubhub app. Go for Grubhub. Every week, hundreds of thousands of fans download the popular Stuff They Don't Want You to Know podcast to get to the bottom of popular culture's biggest myths. And now, the Stuff They Don't Want You to Know book separates conspiracy fact from conspiracy theory, from biological testing to our endless fascination with the Kennedy assassination. This holiday season, give the gift that explains the unexplainable. The Stuff They Don't Want You to Know book. Available now. Order at StuffYouShouldReadBooks.com or wherever you buy your books. And toured with us, and after we started writing, that was eye-opening for me. And I, I understood that, you know, the emotional content was important. And right. that I was maybe misplacing my value on things like technique or volume or like, you know, being intense. That's right. uh, and that there was just, a, there was a, like actually a different type of intensity that was, was actually what people were, you know, responding to that I just didn't know because, you know, as, as self-aware as we try to be, sometimes we, we skip the big things. Right. <laughs> yeah. You're like, well, this works for me. So of course it can work for everybody. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. In a world where everyone is confined to their homes, society begins its largest bin watch to date. In the hallowed library of Hulu, or perhaps on a shelf of DVDs you haven't looked at in a decade, is a show that perfectly encapsulates life in the early aughts and launched a friendship 
that would inspire millions. Hi, I'm Zach Braff. And I'm Donald Faison. In 2001, we starred in Scrubs, a sitcom that revealed a glimpse of what it was like to survive a medical internship. As Turk and JD, we explored guy love. Nearly 20 years later, a lot has changed. We're not supermen, but we're still best friends. Eh. Given the mandatory lockdown, there's no better time to relive the series that brought us together in the first place. And we're doing it with a podcast. That's right, people. We're going to bring friends and crew members and fellow cast members and writers. And, and guess what? We're going to even invite some of you to call into the podcast and ask all the questions you want of the entire Sacred Heart staff. Join us for Fake Doctors, Real Friends on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. Support for today's show also comes from Pet Relief. They make all-natural USDA certified organic CBD products for pets using full-spectrum CBD hemp oil that is grown and extracted in Colorado. So they offer a ton of products that have something to assist a range of ailments such as hip and joint pain, inflammation, situational anxiety, and more for your pets. They also offer oils for both cats and dogs that are made with only two ingredients, full-spectrum CBD hemp oil and organic coconut oil. Their supplements are all handmade and baked with human-grade organic ingredients that have been sourced from farms across the United States. Not to mention, all their products are third-party tested in an effort to be completely transparent. I got some of this stuff, and I have been using it with my, I don't know, 13, 14-year-old pup, Callie. Um, you know, she's, she's, she's an old dog and she's got a lot of hip pains and, uh, I've been noticing it's been, you know, helping a bit. So I, I highly encourage this product to test it out on whatever situation your pet is encountering. So go over to petrelief.com and enter the promo code words to get 10% off your order. That's pet relief, R E L E A F.com offer code words to get 10% off. This stuff's great. Check it out. Uh, the, the idea, I mean, primarily on the fact that, you know, you have built your yourself up, uh, you know, as an artist as well. And, you know, clearly, you know, do a lot of projects for a lot of different people. Um, and, you know, the band is, is clearly one of them. The collision of art and commerce where you start to have to reconcile with the fact that, um, OK, like, you know, I need to know like what to charge for my pieces of art and I need to know what, um, you know, my band is worth a night and like all these things that, you know, are just kind of. They're, they're not only are they important, but they're byproducts of the idea of just being creative. Um, you know, was that, was that, and has that been kind of a difficult world for you to sort of like navigate and understand? Cause usually people that kind of sit in the uh, solely creative world, you know, don't have any desire from a business perspective to like, you know, I mean, you learn basic stuff, but you're like, well, yeah, if I could ignore that, then that would be better. Um, how has that evolved for you over time? Or have you always just been like, well, well yeah. Uh, you know, um, I I would like to I, I don't know the poll up poll a couple of people that I know and maybe they give you different <laughs> answers. I, sure. I I don't I honestly honestly I don't know. Yeah, I'd like to think that I've always been pretty realistic and and uh, and to a certain degree self aware because I, man I I know I'm I know I'm a little crazy. I know that I know that I work a lot. I know that I'm neurotic. I know that I get compulsive and obsessive about things. I know these things about myself. I know I'm difficult to work with in some ways because of that. And I also know I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm also well, this sort of person. I don't, I just don't believe in like false humility. Like I, I, I am, I humble myself in a genuine way about genuine things, but I, but I'm like, Oh no, it's, this record's no good. So I think our recent record is actually quite good. Um, but to, to the point or back to your point about like self-evaluation <clears throat> from, from that more, that from that, uh, potentially, uh, uncomfortable standpoint, fuck no, I, I, I'm psyched when somebody tells me realistically what we are and how nobody's hurt. You know, I was, I was excited and thankful for everybody that ever shot me straight in a, in a way that could have been hurtful to somebody with a more sensitive uh, sense of themselves. And in fact, you know, when, you know, when we, oh, oh, let, me, let me back up a second, but I would say that I only, you know, we, we did everything ourselves until we could no longer do things ourselves. I wasn't that presumptuous, but, and I only ever hired the next, 
you know, the next stage in our, uh, you know, our, our expanding, uh, team when we really like really when we just crossed the line and we really needed it 10 minutes ago, like that was always my method. It was like, okay, at the time when we make the first genuine mistake that, you know, that would have been helped if we'd had, you know, a booking agent or a tour manager or, or whatever, that's the time when you get that person. Um, cause you don't want to make that mistake again. Sure. Again, I was, like, maybe I'm obsessed with making mistakes. I'm right. <laughs> yeah. Um, but everybody, I would, I, I had this thing where I would hire people. I would only hire the people who told me the, the side of the, the side of what we were that I didn't want to hear. And, and that was, the, that's the money. That's the vast minority of people who, you know, who are trying to get you to hire them. It doesn't make sense. You know, really, if you're trying to get, if you're trying to get a band as a client, you, you, you don't, it doesn't really sound like a sensible idea to call them up and tell them that nobody's heard of them or that they're not worth anything. But when somebody told me that, you know, as long, and, and seemed to know what the hell they were talking about. And, you know, I connected with and seemed like, like a sort of good person I could get along with. Those are the people that I hired. I hired our booking agent because he said, nobody, nobody knows who you are because you're not playing the right shows. Uh, and I was like, Oh, well, fair enough. And he's like, and you're not worth anything. Right. You're like, so okay, I'm good not to gonna, know. you know, so, so you're going to, we're going to have to work. We're going to have to work for it. And I was like, perfect. This, that's so much easier on my ears than, you know, the like long white limousine thing, you know, Wayne's world, Mr. Big smoking a cigar. Right. Like, I don't want that. And so, so that became my hiring policy for a long time. It was just like people who were able to give me the tough truth, speak truth to power. Not that I was power, but you know, that's the term we use all the time now. Um, yeah, I mean that was those those are that was how I hire. That's how I've hired people, people who give me that information. I'm so comfortable with it because I don't. I work best when I've got a fire under my ass. I work best in high stress environments. I work best when I got something to prove, and we've always had something to prove. And we've never been the biggest or the best or the most highly paid band. So yeah, so so cool. We don't have to maintain that. Sure. All we have to do is grow. Yep, totally. Yeah, that's the <laughs> that's the thing. Um, I know because uh, you, we have a, a hard out based on this. Uh, I'll just ask you this one last question. Um, you know, kind of touching on what you were saying when you know, I mean, clearly uh, it's been a well documented. You know, your accident, your feelings on it, and you know everything that kind of shifted for you as a person. Um, you know, right. I, I, I imagine that you know, and you actually mentioned this earlier, which I, I was glad I wasn't reading too far into the scenario. That you know, when you're healing, um, you know, regardless of what you've gone through from a traumatic experience, uh, a lot of it can feel very isolating because whether it's like your body is broken or your spirit is broken, those are both isolating things, and you were trying to get yourself back to it. Um, you know, yeah. how, I, I guess how did you sort of retain the connectivity, um, not only to, you know, th- the fact that people were, you know, rooting for you and wanting Baroness to still exist, uh, but then also just like, you know, the, the people that you had from, uh, you know, your day to day life. Um, how did you kind of, I guess, retain those bonds? Or was it mostly from the outside where people were really pushing themselves to be a part of your life? How did that all transpire? I mean, I just think it took work. It took work. I realized, you know, I realized you realize when you're, you know, when you're in situations like that, that, uh, there's a potential for pity to take over or for that situation to define you. And in some ways, you know, using that as a definition point would have been simple because it would have been easy to get press and easy to market and easy to capitalize on. And I really didn't want that to define me. So I recognized that I, while I could neither ignore it, neither could I, bank on it. And so I had to, I had to take that, I had to take that, you know, well, maybe it's not half full and maybe it's not half empty. Maybe it's just half. And that's, that's where I was like right in the middle. And I don't, you know, I wasn't willing to let, I wasn't willing to let something like that get the better of me one way or the other. And so we just put work in, you, know, you just put work in, you'd be, you know, like it just, just took a, a you know, an uptick in level of honesty and, uh, and humility and, you know, being able to admit to people, you know, you needed, you need them, you need their help and they meant a lot to you. And, uh, you know, actually that's all kind of good stuff. So, you know, right. once I, once I had gotten, once I'd gotten to that, you know, once I realized how important that was and how valuable that was, uh, you know, then 
the those relationships became clear again and i wasn't you know i wasn't concerned or i wasn't worried or in doubt about you know people's intentions because it's you know there are you know there were ways that i went about it like talking to people and uh you know moving through the next couple years of my life that uh forced people to prove to me that they weren't doing things out of you know out of pity or um you know out of you know just out of concern there's like okay well we'll just keep john active because that you know he's He's already halfway crazy and, you know, don't, don't want to push him over the edge by ignoring him. So I, I try to be, you know, it's just, just be, you know, it's really like, you know, everybody talks about it. You just got to be honest. It's just about being open and honest and, uh, you know, making sure that you don't, you surround yourself with good people who care, who don't, you know, who are, who care about you and, and who care about, uh, you know, like when it came to the band, like guys who care about music, they didn't care about the sensational part of that story. They, they, you know, the new guys in the band were, they just want to play music. And they didn't see me as like a, you know, like some like weakened person. They saw me as somebody who was trying to, you know, trying so hard to push through it that, yeah, fuck yeah. Like who cares about the, you know, the fact he's in wheelchair and his, you know, arm barely works at that, at that point. It's like, this guy's going for it. I would like to see, I'd like to think that it was that way. And then, you know, then the relations were, were pure and, you know, we don't talk, as a band, we, we never talk about it. Yep. That's the last thing we talk about. Totally. You know, it's something that the press talks about it and, you know, I have to, I have to bring it up, but I'm not uncomfortable doing that because I don't, again, I don't focus on it. Yep. It's, I'd like to think that we have done, we have operated in such a way that, that the, you know, the potential that that accident had to define our career has, has only done so in the way that it, it needed to and no more. Yep. Uh, and it will not be it will not be the only thing that people remember because we actually have some decent music to uh, you know push us through that. Yeah, I know for sure. And to your point, it's the process behind it. You know, it, it, it you mm-hmm. rev, you revel in it from the. I mean, you don't want to put yourself through certain processes, but you know when you can actually just focus on this sort of step by step scenario, then like you said, you come out. Um, you know, not only a stronger person, but you uh, you know a stronger piece of art. Like all of these things exist um, rather than you know, rather than just being like, Oh, I'm overwhelmed by it. It's like, well, no, it's a process. So that's just, yeah, it's, it, it's cool. I, li- yeah, but, I, I like but, hearing but part, you. part of that process is, is, is like, you know, putting, you know, putting a light on that thing that, you know, that has the power over you that, that for, you know, that has the potential to cause fear or anxiety or undue stress or on, you know, uh, like, unwarranted depression and stuff like that and saying, okay, this is a thing that has power over me. I'm going to talk about it so that I, so that I'm giving away that, you know, that quiet, un, unseen power. I'm going to talk about it enough, but I'm not going to focus on it. Totally. I'm talk yeah. about it as much as I, as much as I talk about it, other important things that happened because it was important. Yep. It just wasn't the only important thing that happened that year. No. Totally. Totally. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not the, uh, it's not the punctuation mark. This is a comma. It's like, that's, that's all we're really doing here. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. It was a, it was a comma. It was a, um, it was a comma that I wish, you know, I wish the sentence was short right. enough that it didn't need it you know, <laughs> totally. or whatever. Yeah. 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 You know, no, I totally understand. Go, if I, you know, if I could go back and take it away, I would take it away. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Yep. I would, I would, I would have done something differently that day, but that wasn't the way it panned out. Uh, you know, I got dealt that hand, so I'm playing it. Totally, totally understand where you're coming from. So, well, I'll I'll let you go, but I I could talk to you for a while, but I really appreciate uh, all of your time and all your insight and frankly, all your music because yeah, I really, really uh, have been a fan for a long time. So yeah, thanks for letting me pick your brain, dude. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. All right. How great was that chat with John? He, um, it was really intense. He's an intense dude. But uh, I had 45 minutes with him, so I was like, I'm going to make this count, and he was there for it. I just, uh, you know, sometimes when people are in the middle of, like, a huge press run, sometimes it takes them, you know, a good 10 to 15 minutes to kind of warm up to the idea of what a podcast is, but he was, like, ready from the get-go. There was, like, there's, 
I think there was like five words exchanged before I started recording. I was just like, hey, man, nice to meet you. I'm a really big fan of your band. And he was like, thanks. And we just dove right into it. So thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Monica, for hooking this interview up. And thank you to you, the listener, as always, because, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'd be doing this thing if there were only four of you listening, but there are way more than four of you listening. So, And thank you very much to Doom and Plume for the song, and we will continue to feature that for many, many months and weeks and years to come. And uh, next week, I have a great chat with Lance Wells. He's the vocalist from a band called Faded Gray from Vegas. I had the chat with him, uh, it was probably about a month or so ago. I was out in Vegas and hung out with him at his house. And it was a really, really fun discussion. So happy seventh anniversary of the show. And hopefully I'll be able to do this for another 7, 10, 20, 30 years. And then, uh, you know, maybe I'll hand the microphone over to my son and he can start talking about music. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. Well... Until next week, please be safe, everybody. Special shout out to Sonos.com, the best speaker that I have ever encountered. You need to go to their website, check out all of their offerings. You can listen to different music around the house. It is a superior listening experience and frankly has changed the way that I listen to music. So why would you not do that? Go to Sonos.com, check out all of what they have, and thank you, Sonos. Special shout out to Drip Drop, which is an electrolyte powder developed by a doctor to treat dehydration. It has three times the electrolytes and half the sugar of sports drinks. It tastes amazing. Do it before a workout. Do it after a workout. Do it after a sauna. Whenever you are feeling dehydrated, you'd use it. So go to DripDrop.com and use the code WORDS to get 20% off any purchase. That's DripDrop.com and use the code WORDS. Thank you, Drip Drop. You've been listening to the Jabberjaw Podcast Network, jabberjawmedia.com. Shh. Hi there, I'm Zach Braff. And I'm Donald Faison. We're real life best friends, but we met playing fake life best friends, Turk and JD, on the sitcom Scrubs. 20 years later, we've decided to rewatch the series one episode at a time and put our memories into a podcast you can listen to at home. We're going to get all our special guest friends like Sarah Chalk, John C. McGinley, Neil Flynn, Judy Reyes. Show creator Bill Lawrence, editors, writers, and even prop masters will tell us about what inspired the series and how we became a family. You can listen to the podcast Fake Doctors, Real Friends with Zach and Donald on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, and wherever you get your podcasts. Every week, hundreds of thousands of fans download the popular Stuff They Don't Want You to Know podcast to get to the bottom of popular culture's biggest myths. And now, the Stuff They Don't Want You to Know book separates conspiracy fact from conspiracy theory, from biological testing to our endless fascination with the Kennedy assassination. This holiday season, give the gift that explains the unexplainable. The Stuff They Don't Want You to Know book, available now. Order at StuffYouShouldReadBooks.com or wherever you buy your books. Are you crime curious? iHeart Podcasts has gathered the best true crime all in one podcast feed iHeart True Crime Plus. It's packed with podcasts about unsolved murders, missing persons, organized crime, and more. So there's always something good to binge and share. iHeart True Crime Plus subscribers also enjoy ad free listening, early access to select episodes, and exclusive bonus content. Subscribe to iHeart True Crime Plus today, exclusively on Apple Podcasts. The podcast, and that's what you really missed, brings you back to the choir room for a gloriously gleeky rewatch of all six masterfully musical seasons of Glee. Join cast members Kevin McHale and Jenna Ushkowitz for never-before-heard stories from the cast, crew, celebrities, and you, the fans. From McKinley High to New York City, from the choir room to nationals, and from the Super Bowl to a world tour. Listen to And That's What You Really Missed on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.